Welcome to State of the Art Southern Illinois, a new podcast by the Marion Cultural and Civic Center. Uh, thank you for joining us. And today we've got an interview with Michael Cavanaugh. He's bringing a show to the Marion Cultural and Civic Center this Saturday, April 9th, 2022. The music of Billy Joel and Elton John, starring Michael Cavanaugh. Michael Cavanaugh has a lot of experience with Billy Joel's music. Um, as you'll hear coming up in the interview, You'll hear how Billy Joel himself discovered him uh, and how that then turned into him starring in Moving Out, uh, the Broadway show featuring Billy Joel's music. He was then nominated for a Tony for that. He is an incredibly talented musician, absolutely charming and wonderful to speak to. I really look forward to you enjoying this interview. So enjoy it, and I'll chat with you a little bit after. Well, welcome to State of the Art Southern Illinois. Uh, we're here with Michael Cavanaugh, um, who is coming into Marion this Saturday with the music of Billy Joel and Elton John, starring Michael Cavanaugh of Broadway's Moving Out. Thanks for joining us, Michael. Hey, thanks for having me. How's it going? It's going great. So you're coming to Marion. Uh, what does what does the show look like that you're bringing to Marion this weekend? Well, you know, when you say Billy Joel and Elton John, you know, people are gonna they're gonna be familiar, obviously, with with uh, the songs. You know, where there's so many hits to pick from, it's it's impossible to get to all of them. There's so many great songs, so it's not like you're gonna hear a bunch of songs and you're gonna think, "Oh, I've never heard this before." I don't think I don't think that's gonna happen. Uh, I mean, that's always possible, but you know, we're gonna be doing songs like Rocket Man and Piano Man and Crocodile Rock and you know, New York State of Mind, things like that. It's going to be, uh, I mean, the, the music is incredible from two legends. So I just, I love playing, I love playing this music and I love playing for people that love to hear this music. Well, what's your, what would you say is your favorite song uh, that you're going to be playing this weekend? You know, that's always a tough, that's always a tough question to answer. People ask me that all the time. If I had to pick one song well, for Billy, it would probably be scenes from an Italian restaurant. Some people call it bottle of red, bottle of white. Uh, but that song to me is it's pretty tough to beat. Could we hear a little sample of that? I see you got the keyboard sure. in front of you there. Sure, why not? A bottle of white bottle of red Perhaps a bottle of rosé instead We'll get a table near the street In our old familiar place You and I face to face mm -hmm. A bottle of red A bottle of white Though the pants upon your appetite And beat you anytime you want An Italian restaurant And obviously it goes to Things are okay when be these days And then it goes to Brenda Vanetti with the poppy this day And it has so much to it That's why, that's why I love it so much Yeah, there's a lot of variety in that one No doubt We're really looking forward to that And what was, for you, what was the creation process of this show like? I mean, you seem really passionate about the music uh, itself. So, you know, is there a history there uh, from childhood yeah. for you with these? Or Yeah, so I came up, you know, playing in, uh, playing, well, playing in, in bands first and then uh, piano bars when I was in my 20s. And, uh, you know, so I really learned what songs crowds would react to. Uh, playing in piano bars, you know, getting requests for songs. And sometimes I would be surprised at, at songs they would react to and songs I wouldn't react to. And then taking that and then, you know, performing on Broadway and kind of taking it to the next level as far as, you know, people in a theater versus maybe people at the bar, you know. Uh, and that's, that's different, you know. Um, so I've learned from that. And then, you know, I also perform with symphony orchestras all over the world doing this music as well 
Uh, so I've kind of seen it from from that point of view, from people that are highly educated in the music world that can read music way better than I can uh, to see what, what they respond to. And I kind of take all those different exp experiences together over all the years I've been doing this. And uh, it helps me put together a show you know, when I'm picking from these two amazing legendary artists, I have so much to pick from, but I can I can put together a show that I really feel like is going to work. I'm not going to say regardless of who's there, but almost, you know, because the, the songs are, are so legendary and people identify with them. People hear these songs and it takes them back to a moment in their lives. And I hear stories like like that all the time. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, it's it's amazing that you can connect like that to people because... So much of this was the soundtrack to them growing up and maturing yeah. and, and and becoming who they are today. That it really touches that emotional note and and touches those notes and memories for them. Um, you mentioned Broadway in there. You were the piano man, one of the starring role in move, Broadway's Moving Out, which is purely built from the music of Billy Joel. Correct? Yeah, that is true, and that uh, that changed my life. I like I said, I was <clears throat> excuse me, I was a piano bar guy. And I was working in a dueling piano bar here in Las Vegas, which is where I live again. And uh, I got to know Billy Joel's tour manager. We had some mutual friends. Excuse me, I got a little desert <clears throat> dust in my throat here. <clears throat> so I got to know uh, his, his name was Max, Billy Joel's tour manager. And uh, we become really good friends. And he decided to bring Billy to hear me one night in the piano bar with not a whole lot of notice. <laughs> I, I had about 15 minutes notice that he was coming, and to say I was nervous would be quite the understatement. Yeah, <laughs> I can't imagine. I was trying imagine. not to have a heart attack. But Billy really liked me, which was great, and um, it was a couple months after that that I heard f through Max again. It was uh, Max had Tommy Burns, who's Billy Joel's guitar player, band leader, been with Billy since 1989, so 33 years now, uh, had Tommy call me, who I also met that same week I met. Billy and, and everybody else, and I said, Michael, you know, there's this project in New York. We don't have a name for it yet. We don't know what it is, but Billy's working with Twyla Tharp, and this might go to Broadway. We don't know. Would you come to New York and, and play for Twyla and play for the, the producers, the Needlelanders? And I said, absolutely. So I went there, and, you know, Billy liked me, which was, you would think that would be like the golden ticket. And, I mean, in some ways it was, but honestly, if Twyla wouldn't have liked me, it would have been, it would have been over. Twyla was kind of steering this ship. It was her idea to put all these songs together, make a story out of it. Uh, she was the director. She was the choreographer. And Billy, although he was he was there, and he 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 wasn't getting his he wasn't getting his hands dirty at the beginning. He was kind of seeing what she was going to do first. Interesting. So he was yeah. involved from the beginning, and you didn't you didn't necessarily have a formal audition for Billy, which no, I, I find I mean, really interesting. Yeah, Billy saw me in, in the bar, and he really liked me. So I remember uh, it was, you know, it's a dueling piano bar. For those of you who have never been to one before, you know, it's kind of like Animal House with pianos. It's craziness, right? So, uh, and everybody requests songs, so he wanted to hear some Jerry Lee Lewis, I remember. So he requested it, and I was like, oh, I'm, I'm going to ham this up. So I'm like, and I'm playing with my feet, and I'm playing with my butt. Billy was like, yeah, he loved it. I was like, hey, if I'm not going to show off now, when, when am I going to? So he loved that, and so he, he liked me. And then I, I wanted to play in a couple of my original songs for him, and he, he was very nice, told me he liked those. I was trying not to play any of his stuff. I'm like, I'm not going to play <laughs> Billy Joel in front of Billy Joel. But the whole place is like, piano man, piano man. So I look over at him. He's like, ah, go ahead. So that, I'm like, okay, I'm going to sing piano man in front of Billy Joel. And I did, and he was a good sport. And, you know, on the last course, I would have everybody hold their drinks up. You know, so he picks up his glass of water or whatever it was on the last one <laughs> and he joined everybody and he was a good sport and uh it was incredible so, so he liked me he, he knew i was a solid musician and then he got up on the other piano that's right at the end of my set he got up on the other piano we were jamming together oh that's so legendary. he knew i was a solid musician he knew i could sing the parts and so you know i, I had his thumbs up but he wasn't all that involved yet and so i mean it sounds like you were literally the piano man before you were the piano man well, I mean, yeah, I kind of, it, it, you know, it's one of those things that you prepare your whole life for something and you don't even know you're preparing for it. Yeah. That's wonderful. So yeah. you said he was hands-off in the beginning. Did he become more hands-on as the process developed? 
he did. Again, it was still it was still Twyla's ship to steer. He really had faith in her as far as putting the story together. I mean, he's taking. I mean, she was taking Anthony, who works at the grocery store, and Brenda and Eddie, and they're all in the same song. So like it, the way she did it was genius. So it starts. The show started with Brenda and Eddie being together, scenes from Italian restaurant, and then they break up at the end. Now Anthony, who works at the grocery store, and Eddie have been best friends forever. They're best friends, but now Anthony starts hooking up with Brenda, which causes problems between Eddie and Anthony. And it was just really genius the way she did it. So he was, at first, he was just kind of keeping his eye on things to make sure it wasn't anything that he was going to not like, right? So we, were, mm-hmm. we would do workshops, we would do things, and he would come and he would show up, and he would show up at some rehearsals, but he was just kind of standing back. Then once we got closer to, you know, we did a pre-Broadway run in Chicago, and when we were doing that, certain songs were... That's when you work out the kinks. Like mm-hmm. Certain songs were coming, some certain songs were going, and it was changing. And then it, he was putting in his two cents more. He was around a lot during that point, and, and also when we first started on Broadway. And then once we were up and running, you know, once you, once you open on Broadway, like you can change things during previews on Broadway, but once you open on Broadway, it's usually there are exceptions. Usually it's kind of set in stone what it's going to be. Uh, and then from that point on, he... Everybody, even Twyla and Billy, they, they were able to just kind of let, let the show run itself. And they would come by. Billy would come by relatively often. And sometimes he would get up and do an encore with us at the end of the show. And the audience was never upset about that. Oh, I bet. Yeah. So what was it like uh, as far as like your experience literally in front of a legend like Billy Joel becoming mm-hmm. the modern version of his voice on Broadway? Well, it was, uh, I mean, I was very <laughs> nervous at first. I mean, the guy was my musical hero growing up. Him and Elton both, but I, I would say Billy was probably in the first position, you know. Um, and, you know, it was it was stressful. But at the same time, fortunately, I've never been a guy who cracks under pressure, thank God. So part of me is, like, scared to death, and part of me is, like, I'm ready. Like, let, let's go, right? <laughs> so, um so it was, it was exciting. It was scary. It was fantastic. It was, it was uh, ready to give me a heart attack all at the same time. It was all those things at the same time. But Billy was so supportive and so great about it. I remember when we were getting ready to do the first official workshop, you know, and I, I knew I had to play Angry Young Man in front of him. You know, that's the one that goes like, you know, that one. And I'm like, I'm, he comes up to me before I'm about to go on, and he, like, gives me this big hug. He's like, you're going to be great. You're going to be great. And I remember we were doing Uptown Girl, and I started singing the wrong words. <laughs> and I look out at the audience, and he goes, hey! <laughs> and he starts, and that made me laugh, and I totally relaxed after that. That's you know, awesome. Because, you know, when, when, I, when I speak to the younger generation all the time, I, I tell them, if, if, if you want to pretend that mistakes aren't going to happen, you can live in that fairy fairy tale land but that is not the truth they're gonna happen it's it's how you how you handle them so billy really he he made me relax he did and he wound up coming to so many shows that i i eventually started to totally relax i remember when his daughter alexa came then i was nervous all over again because i'm thinking she's gonna because this is what i'm thinking she's gonna say who does this guy think he is you know he's not my dad she was as sweet as can be she was as sweet as can be and she gave me this big hug, and she said, "You know, you're you're making the song your own. I love it." And she was great. So that's really wonderful. Great experience. Yeah, um, Broadway's so, a grind. Broadway yeah. is a grind, but it was it was the best grind that's ever happened to me. That's for sure. Yeah. Well, and it. I mean, it really. I mean, it. You were already a professional performer on piano yeah. and vocal. I mean, you were Forever. already used to doing it every night. Yeah. You know, just. And your voice was used to it. You were essentially a machine already with that type of music. And so coming into that, I imagine you were somewhat prepared, but there's, a, I, I assume there's an additional level um, there of is, intensity there, once know, it gets it was, to Broadway. There is. There's a, and, and that's what's helped me so much transitioning into the types of shows I do now, whether it's in a performing arts center, whether it's with the Boston Pops. Once you've done Broadway, as far as the, the level, the intensity level, it, it doesn't really doesn't really get any higher than that you know like yeah. as far as people sitting out there i mean some people in broadway they sit out there like this they're like impress me mm-hmm. especially in new york city because you know we did our pre-broadway run in in chicago actually 
And, you know, it was, it was great, but I would say the people in New York, they, they have high expectations, you know, because they're, they're the Broadway people. They're the ones that have been seeing Broadway forever. So, yeah, once I did that, I felt like, okay, I, can, I think I can handle this as a career. Even though, yeah. I, like you said, I'd already been doing it forever. I started playing in nightclubs professionally when I was 12. Wow. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. talking about the intensity of Broadway, but what would you say was your favorite part of that process of the show creation through to the performances moving through your run in the, in the lead role on Broadway. My favorite part was the level of detail, the level of commitment that everyone in that show had. Uh, it was just, I've played with a lot of talented guys in bar bands when I was younger and they might be the most talented people ever, but, it's it's just not dialed in the same way, you know. Yeah. It's it, it's it's like, you know, it's like the best the best football teams aren't even always the ones that have all the best players. It's like when they come together as a team and just the way it was dialed in, it was like nothing I had ever experienced before. And once you get used to that, boy, it's 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 hard to get used to it, to it any other way. And I, you know, the guys that I travel with have been with me now for 16 years, so it's like. Wherever I wherever I go, they will follow me. If I lead yeah. them to the path of destruction, they're going to follow me there. <laughs> Which, I mean, that's kind of a joke, but uh, you know, it's it's dialed in. Mm -hmm. That that's what I noticed. The first thing about Broadway is just how dialed in it was. It was amazing. Uh, you also were nominated for a Tony for the lead role in Moving Out. Um, what was your experience at the Tonys like? So whenever anyone says they were nominated, that means they lost. <laughs> uh, my experience at the Tonys, it's so funny because I was pretty positive I wasn't going to win because we were up, we were up uh, the same year as Hairspray. And we knew Hairspray, although we did win a couple of Tonys, I was up against a guy named Dick Latessa, who is from my hometown. We're both from the Cleveland area. Nicest guy in the world. This guy had been on Broadway longer than I had been alive at that point the writing was on the wall like he was he was getting all these all these achievement awards and all these things throughout the year all these acknowledgments that he totally deserved so i was like not gonna win i, I remember there was an article it was either the new york post or it was the new york times it was one i think it was the post and they were saying for each award who's going to win and who should win well one one of the guys was nice enough to say well, Latessa's going to win, but Kavanaugh should win. That was, an, that was nice of him to say. Um, but I kind of knew. So I didn't write a speech. I was like, I'm not going to write a speech because I'm not going to win. Then once I started announcing the nominees, I started thinking to myself, I didn't write a speech. <laughs> like, <laughs> I started, like, if I win this thing and I forget to thank my wife or my parents, I'm a dead man. Mm -hmm. So the funny thing is when they've, the first reaction to when they read Dick Latessa's name, my first reaction was, Whew. and about 10 <laughs> seconds later, I was like, oh, man, I wanted to win that thing. You know, but <laughs> for 10 seconds, I was relieved. And it was, it was amazing. It was, it was, you know, how many times you get to experience something like that in your yeah. lifetime? You know, you have your red carpet moment, and you have, you know, it was, it was incredible. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. So. You know, we've all been through a lot over the last couple of years in the performing arts industry. Um, the pandemic's hit our industry, I'd say, as hard, if not harder, than any industry out there, considering Agreed. our job is literally to bring large groups of people together. Yeah. Um, so what was your pandemic experience like? Well, you know, at first, I think like a lot of us, I remember my agent told me, he said, you know, we're probably looking at. 18 months of this. And I'm like, no way. That's what I was saying. I'm like, you are, there's no way this is going to last this long. Shows you what I knew, right? So yeah. I remember thinking, well, I have to do something or I'm going to go crazy. So it started with just, you know, getting my phone out and, and, and pointing this camera in my head and trying to go live on, I think it was Facebook the first time. I was scared to death because... Just like right now, like <laughs> musicians will understand. Like I felt like the, the entire world was listening to my monitor mix. Like it's it's so 
is so detailed, like every little nook and cranny. If I screw up, you're going to hear it. So I was, it was a new experience. It's something I'd never done before. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, I've, I've been on TV a bunch of times before, but I don't know. There was something different about this. It was so up close. It was, it was unrehearsed. And I talked to a lot of my other performing friends. They felt exactly the same way. That, that did the live streaming thing. So I started doing it, started to relax. And, you know, there were times where there were, there were a lot of people on there during the pandemic. Yeah. I was like, wow. Um, and did, did you experience I, I done, that it's, there, it's like, it's like you're, instead of a big performance to a big hall, there's an intimacy to it. Like you're letting someone inside your home and letting yes. someone really get to know you as opposed to being on stage in front of a thousand people. They're really seeing the inside for sure. Um, uh, to where, you know, um, yeah, there was something special about it. You know, uh, I got to perform a lot more of my original songs and the people started requesting my songs, which... You know, I don't do a whole lot of on the road because where I'm performing, you know, I'll probably sneak one of my originals in there, um, and it you'll see you'll see how much it'll remind you of Billy Joel and Elton John, how much they've influenced me. But I, but but I'm not going to cram stuff down their throat that they don't know. Usually, when I when I do it, it's we're we're three quarters away through the show, and I say, hey, I'm going to hey, play one of my songs, and by then the audience knows me and they want to hear it, and then we do one, and then we go back to the regularly scheduled program, but. The, the live streaming was great for that. Um, it was great. Yeah, people got to see maybe a little more what I w- was about. There was some question and answer. So I'd be like, <clears throat> I'd be playing and singing here, and I'm seeing all these comments just go by like a million miles an hour. And every once in a while, I'd see one, and somebody would say, you know, this song means something to me because of this. And then I'd be able to take a minute and address that person. And it was it was interesting, you know? And then I'm seeing all these hearts flying around, I'm like this is this is different. I remember when I when I went back to doing my first real show in front of a in front of an audience. I remember I said, "It's so great to be in front of real people again." I said, "I'm expecting hearts to be flying out of your heads right now." <laughs> but it, but I'd rather hear them sing and I'd rather hear their applause. Uh, but you know, I still do the live streaming thing about once a month, um, and you could follow me on Facebook or YouTube, either one of those places. And it's there's still something cool about it, like. And I'll probably always do it now. You know, it's just, like you said, it, it's, it's, it's a closer look inside. You know, around uh, Christmas time, I'll do, a, I'll do a Christmas episode where I play all the, all the Christmas songs. And it's fun. You know, That's awesome. I, I certainly, don't, I don't want it to be the main thing I do. No. But I'm thankful that I had it. Because for one reason, just to keep my chops up. Like, mm-hmm. if, if I stop doing this for a year and a half... Bad things are going to happen. <laughs> yeah, sure. I mean, we were we were a hot mess trying to put on our first couple of shows coming back to life. Um, yeah. We had essentially turned into a an online content studio here. Mm-hmm. And uh, once we got back to live, it was it was eye-opening because we had been out of it for so long. Yeah. I remember like, how do I, how do I pack my suitcase? <laughs> like, it was like my packing chops are terrible right now. I used to have a place for... And, you know, they're back now. My yeah. packing chops are back. But little things like that, you know, just um, just navigating my way around the airport again, especially with all the new restrictions. It was just, it was different. Yeah. It was different. But, uh, you know, I, I try to find a silver lining in, in everything. And there were some cool things that, that I learned uh, during the pandemic. Things I learned about uh, my own playing. I was able to work on certain things with my playing and my singing. Certain details that maybe when you're doing a show so many nights every week that you're not able to dig into. So I was able to kind of uh, discover a few more things about myself during that time. So that was that was good. Yeah. It, if you'd be willing, we'd love for you to include a few more than just one of your original tracks in in the show. Oh, cool. All That'd right. That'd be great. I mean, I'm. Okay. I mean, I'm. I'm not necessarily the entire voice of Marion, but coming from the director of the venue, I'd I'd love to hear some more of that. Yeah. Great. That's well. Then, then we will. That's awesome. great. That's great to hear. Awesome. That makes me happy. That's for sure. <laughs> um, are there any lessons that you learned from the pandemic? From yeah, from yeah. it that, uh, that that will carry through in your it, back going back into live. Yeah, I learned. I tell you what, I learned. I learned that what I do is, um, what we do, is 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 more important to people's lives than than I even realized, like as far as not just entertain, not just, not just to forget about life for a while. I'm stealing a line there. You've probably heard that line <laughs> for, for the time being, but you know, when, when, and I never realized it so much, but 
when I started doing the the streaming and, and people were writing to me so much and they would tell me how like it would change not just their day but their week their month and it would bring them out of a funk that mm -hmm. they might have been in mentally or or or, or, or spiritually or whatever and um, so I learned that that uh, what we do is is bigger than I thought it was it's bigger it's certainly bigger than I am you know it music is it's it's even more powerful than I thought it was. It's an that's emotional language, that's for sure. It's something it definitely that is. truly it's, connects. Yeah, I, I read, I saw a meme that said, "Music are what feelings sound like," and I would I would agree with that. Yeah, that's awesome. Mm -hmm. Well, um, I really thank you for your time today. I mean, we really yeah. look forward to the show. Um, would you want to play us out one more time with with a tune that we can hear coming up this weekend? Maybe. Hey, why don't you go with one of your originals? I'd be I'd love to hear that. One of my originals. All right. So what I'll do. I am going to do a song. Now you're going to hear you're going to hear a band. Okay? Th these are the tracks from the album that you're about to hear. I played all the instruments except for drums on the album, but obviously when I play live, I have a band with me. But uh let's see which one I'm going to do. This is a song I wrote called One Smile and uh I think the song will pretty much explain itself. Here it goes. One smile can make a difference One smile can change it all One smile can make a difference She's the new kid in school Another zip code, and her name is the pawn sign for the other kids' jokes. When the lunch bell rings, you see you sitting alone, and if you're feeling afraid, to say hello. One smile can make a difference. One smile can change. And his words are a little unclear People act so nervous when he's walking away They just stare at the ground like they don't know what to say Wonderful. Thank you so much for Thanks, sharing man. that with us. Thank you for sharing your time with us this evening. You got it. Everyone watching, yeah, to you. come out and see uh, Michael Cavanaugh this Saturday, March 
9th, no, April 9th, um, at the Marion Cultural and Civic Center. We still have uh, tickets available at marionccc.com. We look forward to seeing you there. Thank you again, Michael. This has been wonderful. Thank you. That was the incredibly talented Michael Cavanaugh. Uh, I can't wait for you to experience some of his music this weekend here at the Marion Cultural and Civic Center. Tickets are still available at marionccc.com. Come and join us for that. Tune in for future podcasts with State of the Arts Southern Illinois, this new podcast by the Marion Cultural and Civic Center. We will be featuring local artists, artisans, musicians, arts organizers, arts organizations. We want to bring you all of the news about the arts in Southern Illinois, keep you up to date, let you get to know some of those artists, musicians, um, and then we'll also be bringing in national touring artists like Michael Cavanaugh um, that are going to be coming here into the Marion Cultural and Civic Center and into Southern Illinois. So stay tuned. Keep up with us. Currently, we're on Spotify, Amazon Music, Podbean, YouTube, and here on Facebook. Right here on the Civic Center's Facebook page, you'll be able to see the episodes as well. So we look forward to seeing you again soon. Again, tune in to State of the Arts, Southern Illinois.